Wait, this next bit's off the record. Turn your tape off. We're already off the record. Ah, oh, shit, I left my tape on. Let me get that. Again? Hold on. Oh, wait, it was off already. But yours is on. No, mine's definitely off already, Vince. Well, anyway, where were we? Stephen Kay, your co-prosecutor on the Manson case. I showed him a note of yours I found. That makes you an accessory to perjury. He said it could overturn Manson's conviction. And that guy's a total loser, trust me. We used to call him Stinky Steve because he always smelt like cat food. Pause. I think we need to rewind. Let's go back to August 8th, 1969. The tension broke that day. The paranoia was fulfilled. The front page of that morning's LA Times described an ordinary day in the city. In London, the Beatles would be photographed crossing the street outside their studio, a shot that would become the front cover of Abbey Road. Less than three weeks earlier, NASA had put the first man on the moon, supposedly. The number one song in the country was Zager and Evans in the year 2525. And later that night, a man and three women got into a beat-up yellow 1959 Ford Galaxy and headed towards Beverly Hills. A ranch hand heard one of the women say, We're off to kill some fucking pigs. That woman was Susan Atkins. She was accompanied by Tex Watson, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian. The four arrived at 150 Cielo Drive, the home of actress Sharon Tate and her husband Roman Polanski. At the top of the driveway, they found 18-year-old Stephen Parent. Watson shot him four times and he died instantly. Inside the house, they found Polish emigre Wojtek Frykowski asleep on the couch. Heiress to a coffee fortune, Abigail Fulton in the guest bedroom and upmarket hairdresser Jay Sebring with Sharon Tate. They tied them up and Watson shot Sebring in his lung. Atkins began stabbing Frakowski. He managed to get up and run out onto the front lawn, but was promptly shot twice by Watson with a total of 51 stab wounds. Inside, Folger had used the commotion to run out the back door. Krenwinkel caught up with her and stabbed her to death. Watson then ordered Atkins to kill Sharon Tate. She did and wrote pig on the front door in her blood. This version of events is how the man I was talking to earlier, Vince Bugliosi, tells it in his book, Helter Skelter, the number one best-selling true crime book of all time. He was the lead prosecutor of the Manson trial and captivated the nation with stories of murderous hippies, brainwashing, race wars, and acid trips gone awry. My task that afternoon was to press him on some of his conduct during the trial. I believe there's a lot more to the case than his official narrative would suggest. But wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get back to 1969. The very next night at the Spawn Ranch, our killers reconvene. This time with three new additions. Clem Grogan, a musician and high school dropout. Leslie Van Houten, a former homecoming princess from the suburbs of Los Angeles. And then there was their leader, Charles Manson. The seven of them piled into the same Ford Galaxy on a search for more victims. After nearly three hours of restive driving, Manson finally settled on 3301 Waverly Drive, home to Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. He entered the house alone and tied the couple up by himself. You know, a long time ago, being crazy meant something. Nowadays, everybody's crazy then ordered Watson, Krenwinkel, and Van Houten to go inside and kill everyone. I want you to go inside They stabbed and kill Leno everyone. 26 times and carved the word war into his stomach. He was impaled with a carving fork and a steak knife. Rosemary suffered 41 stab wounds, many inflicted post-mortem. Before leaving, they wrote Rise and Death to Pigs on the walls and referenced the Beatles song Helter Skelter on the fridge, although somehow spelt it wrong. I still haven't quite figured out how they managed that one. When I get to the bottom, I go back to the top of the side. Where I stop and I turn and I go for a ride. And I get to the bottom and I see you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, Tom, I'm a decent guy, okay? I'm going to educate you on just how decent I am. You found some things I did not. It's a testament to your research, but I would never in a trillion years do what you're accusing me of doing. Even if I had done it, it goes nowhere. It's preposterous. It's, it's silly. Who cares? It means nothing. You're a loser, let me tell you.
Vince, I have here that it took almost four months for Manson to be caught and arrested. Well, the LAPD didn't connect the two cases at first. They had a lot of false leads, a lot of dimwits working there, okay? They didn't connect two cases with identical MOs that happened one day and eight miles apart? That sounds improbable. Well, one thing's for sure. If I was police chief, it would have never happened. I would be the greatest police chief. Everybody says it. They always tell me. The bloodshed, in all its primitive defiance, confirmed a sense of rupture in America. The decade's subversive spirit had come on with too much fervor. Some reckoning was bound to come. Joan Didion famously remarked that The 60s ended abruptly on August 9th of 1969. The tension broke that day. The paranoia was fulfilled. But that's not exactly true. The 60s ended on December 1st, when LAPD announced that the crimes had been solved. Manson and the family's mugshots were emblazoned on every television in the world. These weren't the faces of hardened criminals or escaped lunatics. They were hippies, stereotypical flower children, in the bloom of wide-eyed youth. Unshaven, unwashed, tie-dyed tops and buckskin jackets. They lived in roving communes, caravanning along the Golden Coast in technicolor bright buses and clunkers cobbled together from spare parts. They believed hallucinogens strengthened the spirit and expanded the mind. They gave birth naturally and lived in rustic simplicity. In other ways, their philosophy was Gnostic. They believed time did not exist and that there was no good, bad, or death. All humans were God and the devil at the same time. A sociologist, Dr. Louis Yablonsky, had this to say on the hippie movement. Well, Steve, the answer is simple. They are neither based nor red-pilled. In fact, I would even say they are cringe. Even when they act as if they love, they can be totally devoid of true compassion. That is the reason why they can kill so matter-of-factly. Many hippies are socially almost dead inside, and they smell really bad, too. Some require massive emotions to feel anything at all. They need bizarre intensive acts to feel alive, sexual acts, acts of violence, nudity, every kind of Dionysian thrill. The New York Times described a world of indolence, free sex, and midnight motorcycle races. The allure is obvious. The family's starry-eyed communalism, rejection of solid conventional American values, and veneration of LSD offered a screen on which anybody could project his insecurities about the era's politics and pressures. It was an invitation to freedom. But just as rapidly as this new zeitgeist had dawned, it dusked. Vince, could you tell me about the trial? Remind me, what was the motive for these murders? The trial, oh, that takes me back. God, I, I was so handsome back then. District Attorney Bugliosi, would the prosecution please make its case? Um... Yeah, so basically Manson really liked the Beatles, okay? He was a big Beatles fan. He thought they were speaking to him through the lyrics in their songs. He thought Helter Skelter meant the black man would rise up against the, the white establishment and kill all white people in a race war. But he thought black people were too stupid to kill him and his followers and that they would hide in the bottomless pit from Revelations 9 and then inherit the earth and rule over the blacks. He said that his family would be horsemen, okay, and dune buggies would be their horses and uh, that they would ride around and save white babies. Your Honor, I can explain. My client is uh, just a Sigma male. Well, Mr. Bugliosi, what was the motive for the killings those nights? Oh, yeah. Um, well, Manson wanted to start the race war early, so he killed these rich white people and tried to frame the Black Panthers for it, okay? Hence the misspellings. He thought it would trigger civil unrest. He picked the house on Cielo Drive because the man who used to live there, Terry Melcher, wouldn't give him a record deal, and he wanted to scare him. Well, I have to say, that all makes perfect sense to me. Mr. Manson, do you have anything to say for yourself? My father is the jailhouse. My father is your system. I am only what you made me. I am only a reflection of you. I'm on trial for being Jesus Christ. Mr. Manson, please quieten down or I'll have to have you removed. No, Judge. I'll have you removed. I have a little system of my own, you see. Um, no, I'll have you removed. No, I'll have you removed. No, you. No, you. No, you. No, you. I'll remove you. I'll remove you one more times than you can ever say. Well, I'll remove you one more times than that. Guilty man, say what? What? Gotcha. Throw lock him up and throw away the key.
You have judged yourselves! Better lock your door and watch your own kids. Your whole system is a game. You blind stupid people, your children will turn against you. Vince, what do you make of all that helter-skelter narrative? It all sounds a bit far-fetched. No? Well, I don't think Manson or Tex actually believed any of it, but I think the girls definitely did. Wait, hold on. If you don't think Manson believed any of it, then what was his actual motive? Doesn't that undermine the helter-skelter narrative? Nothing could be worse than accusing a prosecutor of what you're implying I allegedly did. Allegedly. It's extremely, extremely defamatory. I'll sue you. It will be a hundred million dollar lawsuit. I'll tell you. It will be the biggest lawsuit, that, the greatest lawsuit. I think, I think going forward, we ought to view ourselves as adversaries. I think it's about time you leave, Tom. You're a phony and a slanderer. You'll be hearing from my attorney. Driving away, I felt despondent. I'd just gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the most famous prosecutors and true crime authors in the world. Of course I hadn't broken him. I replay that afternoon in my head at night frequently, wondering where I might have caught him in a lie. I really thought that with enough tenacity I could have got to the truth behind all of this. By now, most of the people who had the full story, including Manson, have died. And the questions I had then have continued to consume me for 20 years. But I'm certain of one thing. Much of what we accept as fact is fiction. In a white room with black curtains near the station. Black roof country, no gold pavements, tired stallings. Hey guys, it's me, Charles Manson. Just wanted to say thanks for watching and be sure to share, like, and subscribe for more.